Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today, Dr. Zujiki and Rodriguez. I'm gonna talk about esophageal diverticula. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. I'm gonna talk today not about the traction diverticula, but only about hypopharyngeal diverticula and epiphrenic. So hyper, hypopharyngeal, colloquially, clo, colloquially, I don't know, known as zinkers, um, is the more common by a lot. Epiphrenic are, is, is more rare. Um, it's also probably more often treated um, by us as a field. I think we kind of split zinkers with um, otolaryngologists. So uh, zinkers happen more commonly in men, more commonly in people in their seventh, seventh and eighth decade. Um, epiphrenic is split, uh, women and men, more commonly in middle age, whatever that is. Um, the symptoms uh, are listed here and are similar between the two. The only difference is epiphrenic will tend to have a little bit more chest pain. Zinkers aren't as uncomfortable. Diagnosing a hypopharyngeal diverticula. Um, endoscopy is important. You need to know the position of the diverticula and then if there's anything else going on in the esophagus that you may need to treat, including GERD, which can predispose people to diverticula. Um, es esophagram is helpful just to tell you how large and what position the diverticulum is in and how well it empties or doesn't. A manometry is not necessary, but if you have manometry, you might find a cricopharyngeal bar. You can see here that the UES, uh, it's indicated with a little asterisk, does not fully relax with swallow, and that can be an indication that you either have a Zenkers or a Zenkers uh, in process. Oh, that's just showing you that often your true lumen is smaller than your diverticulum, so scope with caution. Uh, treatments, you know, the open diverticulectomy, the old standby that we don't do as often. Uh, rigid transoral um, has its limitations, and then we'll talk mostly today about flexible endoscopic diverticulectomy. So, all three of these are relatively successful, anywhere from 80 to 100%, maybe slightly lower in the flexible group. Um, symptom recurrence, though, is not insignificant in all of the groups, right? And the morbidity rate is uh, also not insignificant. Anesthesia requirements, technically you can do a flexible diverticulectomy under uh, sedation rather than general. I'm not super comfortable with that myself, but I know it's possible, so. That is definitely different than the other two approaches. Now, time-wise, a rigid endoscopic, when you can do it, is very fast, um, but also it's not available for everyone, right? Not every 70 and 80-year-old person can put their head in that position and open their mouth like that. So flexible endoscopic approaches are definitely applicable to a wider variety of people. And what's important is the morbidity of these procedures has dropped with time. So as we've advanced our tech, we've also decreased the morbidity that people experience, including major morbidities like leak. So I'm gonna talk about two kinds of flexible diverticulectomy of the hypopharyngeal diverticulum, non-tunneled and tunneled. So non-tunneled, as indicated, you do not have to do a submucosal, uh, a mucosal lift and a submucosal tunnel at all. You use a, a cap, a dissecting cap, that's the le upper left picture, and then you use a diverticuloscope. That puts one flange in the diverticulum lumen, one flange in the true lumen, and then you see a septal view just like you see on the left, and you basically divide that septum with energy. Your choice, you can use a needle knife, they have specialized grasping energy devices that can deliver a more sort of insulated focused energy. Um, and you, people have described using laser, uh, argon, you know, choose your own adventure. So the pros to this approach is it's really fast. Um, the con is that perforation, um, recurrence and bleeding can happen. So in my mind, Perforation, you've gone too far, right? You've cut more than the muscle. Recurrence, you haven't cut quite enough of the muscle. And I haven't done this procedure myself, but I've seen several and I do not, it's not clear to me with all of the energy and thermal spread that everyone can do a perfect on the nose myotomy with this technique. So a flexible endoscopic tunneled myotomy is sort of borrowing the technology of POEM and using it up in the hypopharynx, right? So I've seen it called two different things, peroral endoscopic septotomy or a Zenkers peroral myotomy or z -pome. 
This is a um, 10 center study um, of about 75 patients that did a very standardized Z poem technique with great success, 92%. The technique, um, it took about 52 minutes to do, so slightly longer than the non-tunneled approach, but the morbidity was quite low at only 6.7%. And if you compare head-to-head -head tunneled versus non-tunneled, the upper study is a Hopkins, uh, well, it's, an, um, it's a multi-institutional study, but um, centered at Hopkins of 205 patients. There's actually 245, I excluded the rigid uh, group. I wasn't interested in comparing those. But the success rate of POEM and non-tunneled are not statistically different. The only difference here is that the POEM group is, has a higher morbidity rate. But of note, they counted subcutaneous emphysema as morbidity. And for anyone who works in the third space a lot, subcutaneous emphysema can just be part of your day, so it doesn't always mean anything, at least that's my take. So the bottom study is a group um, of the Global Cleveland Clinic group looking at 28 patients, POEM approach versus the non-tunneled approach, and they had a 100% success rate with POEM. Um, versus 89% with the non-tunneled. A higher recurrence uh, rate, but not st reaching statistical significance. Um, the follow-up duration was different for the POEM group and the non-tunneled group, and so that, I figured that, that had played into it. However, most recurrences after the non-tunneled approach were actually quite early, so bef almost before the year mark, so maybe not. So morbidity was um, similar. And here's the thing that gets me with um, this technique in general, right? Is you have to do a complete myotomy. You have to get all the way through this cricopharyngeal muscle, but you absolutely cannot penetrate the buccopharyngeal fascia, because if you do, you're in the retropharyngeal space, leak ensues, and then mediastinitis sometimes, right? So um, the complications, while you know not overwhelmingly common, can be bad. So in my mind, this is the perfect use of a tunnel technique, where you can keep your mucosal incision high, and you can tunnel down on the esophageal side of the muscle, you can lift your mucosa away and protect it, and you can see very well both sides of that septum as you're coming down and dividing it. So for me, it's a no-brainer to use this POEM technique. I, I'm probably a little biased. So I'm gonna switch over to epiphrenic diverticula. Um, these are pretty rare uh, in comparison, but they're worked up a very similar way. So you need an upper endoscopy, again, to just understand the diverticulum. How large is it? How wide at mouth is it? What's going on inside of it? Last week, two weeks ago, I had to pull a lot of chicken out of a diverticulum, right? Um, barium esophagram is helpful to tell you what size that diverticulum is, um, and then where it is in relation to the diaphragm and GE junction somewhat. And then manometry is absolutely critical here, right? It's not like a hypopharyngeal diverticulum where it's optional. Absolutely mandatory to get manometry on these people. If you need to use endoscopy to guide your catheter, fine, but you need to understand what's going on with motility. The treatment, again, started with open approaches to diverticulectomy through the chest, and then um, we switched over to laparoscopy through the abdomen, and I'm gonna focus a lot of my talk today on endoscopic approaches. I will say that laparoscopic approach is relatively successful, right? Again, we have a pretty high success rate in improving symptoms no matter how we do this. The difference here is that we have a higher leak rate for open and for laparoscopic if we're resecting the diverticulum, right? You have a staple line and maybe there's a leak rate, especially if you don't do a myotomy. So there have been studies that show that a myotomy is critical to reducing your morbidity. So there's two endoscopic approaches that I think are interesting for this technique. One is the endoscopic diverticular septotomy or DPOM. I guess we're gonna get through all letters of the alphabet and poem it all, but <laughs> DPOM it is, right? So this is a study out of China looking at 10 patients. This is all types of diverticulus, so there were only three that were epiphrenic in this particular set. But they did depoem, average time took 39 minutes. They're basically treating this like a zenkers where you're cutting down right on the diverticular septum. You're not making as long of a tunnel and you're going right at the diverticulum itself. So they had a 90% overall success, it was 100% for the depoem group, but a very short follow-up. But intriguing, anyhow. There's another group out of Japan that looked at poem for epiphrenic diverticula. They just, what they did was look back at their poem experience and said, oh, 14 of these people had an epiphrenic diverticula. How did they do? 
and um, they just did the same standard poem they would do for anyone. They saw 100% symptom improvement, no leaks, with a median follow-up of 12 months. I find this esophagram really interesting. So you can see that there is a clear diverticulum, there is no outflow, and then after poem on the right-hand side, you have much improved outflow. You don't touch the diverticulum, right? You're just basically fixing the outflow obstruction that caused the diverticulum. So. And here's some literature from the laparoscopic um, surgeons that kind of support this approach, right? So this is a group that did a laparoscopic myotomy, no diverticulectomy with a fundal application, and they followed these patients for 68 months. And they, there were 22 patients, I think they had three that had persistent symptoms, they took two of the diverticula off, one got better, one didn't. Um, and so they said, well, only a few people will need a staged resection of the diverticulum, right? So isn't that interesting? Because I think that really does lend itself well to an endoscopic approach for these. So my own algorithm for a hypopharyngeal diverticulum, I'm going to start with a Z poem. If that fails, then you're going to either repeat a septotomy or you're going to do a, a formal open diverticulectomy, just depending on the situation and mechanism of failure, right? So uh, for an epiphrenic diverticulum, I start with a standard poem and then I'm going to monitor for symptoms and I'm going to do either, well, I've not done a deep poem, but it sounds cool to try afterward. But if it's, again, it has to do with the mechanism and why people fail. So a, a laparoscopic diverticulectomy is reasonable. So myotomy is a must. If you take one thing away, take that away. But do what you do well in approach. So we have a lot of treatment options always increasing, and you should consider endoscopy if you can. Thanks.